Welcome everyone. I see people slowly getting in. Um, thank you for coming back tonight. Uh, this is, I, I know, I, I was reminded of how difficult Uber can be. Uh, <laughs> Very difficult. As a, as, as a writer, um, but I, I appreciate your patience. Um, I may may have been a little more intrepid than I uh, than I should have been, but we're going to make sense of this material tonight. Um, I was going to say, is my parents as my witness, but unfortunately they won't be here. They'll have to watch the recording. But but my goal will be pretty simple. The, the first part we're going to look at some some eye and down material um, through through stories in his life, and then we're going to analyze some of the texts that seem to be um, maybe a little bit opaque. And, and hopefully um, they'll make sense. I, I will say that I think one of the more difficult, um, what, what makes Buber so difficult is that he's grounded in so many different intellectual traditions, whether it's philosophy or poetry or um, the different uh, sacred texts of different religious traditions and languages. It's really hard to just keep up with what he's quoting and what he's citing. And then all the, the micro conversations that he's having um, in, in, in the context, the references that he's making to people we just don't read anymore or, or, or even know about. And so that, that, that makes it difficult. And, and we're gonna make sense of that a little bit tonight. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to share my screen. Um, and we'll, we'll get started. And, and my goal honestly is that you will have just a little better understanding of what you read for today by the end of um, the class tonight. Um, we, we'll take baby steps and we'll, and we'll see why that that's okay. Um, all right, so here we are in the class. We finally made it to I and Thou. Um, next week, we're gonna see some of the, the political applications of I and Thou. So if you thought this was opaque and dense, um, Imagine trying to apply that to a complicated political situation. Um, and that's what we're going to do. And then we'll get to the biblical humanism and dialogical community. Um, and then we'll, we'll take a breath. All right, so tonight, this is the welcome. Um, I have the review of last class. I, I'll probably share some anecdotes to give some, um, some perspective on how revelation happens in uh, in everyday life. I have three stories that I want to share with you about Buber. Um, and so the, the question will be, are they articulating the same message? And then we have a breakout room. Um, and we're going to unpack some of the messages from those stories, just to get us ready for the second part, which is I and thou. Um, I want to give a very, very brief introduction of I and thou. Um, while the writing can be complicated. The ideas, surprisingly, um, I don't think are as, as complicated. It's the, the application of those ideas that, that get a little bit blurry, muddied, and, and, and opaque. And then I lifted three texts from what you read today, and, I, and I'm going to walk us through it and just to get a better sense of, of what, at least what I think he might be doing. And then um, you'll go out to a breakout room. You'll, you'll talk a little bit more. And then we'll end the class with, with some Q and A. Um, so what we can end up, what we can do is anything that, that seems unclear, um, uh, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll try to make it more clear. We'll just ask some questions and, and, and we'll go from there. And, that, and we'll probably record that because it, um, it, it won't be the, the intimate conversation. It will really just be filling in some blanks. Um, all right. Few guiding questions for today's class. One, how do I change my relationship to nature, things, and human beings so that I can open myself up to glimpses of the eternal? That's very much what, what I and Thou is trying to do. It's trying to, to change how we relate to, to nature, to objects, and to people. Um, to open up ourselves to, to glimpses of this eternal thou. How is it possible for God to need humans as much as humans need God? So when you were doing your reading today, it's possible for today, it's possible you glossed over that 
uh, statement. Um, it's it's wedged into between several dense paragraphs, and you know you could be forgiven for just jumping over it. But he makes a, a, a rather um, provocative claim that God needs human beings as much as human beings needs God, need God. He also makes a very provocative claim in 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 what he talks about with atheists and agnostics. How can atheists and agnostics be closer to God, as Buber argues in Ayn Dao, than practicing religionists? So why, why does he think that, that some atheists and some agnostics um, have a, a, a deeper sense of the ineffable and the eternal? And then finally, is God and or godliness found in treating people equally or as equals? It, it may sound like semantics, but just think about that over the next uh, hour and a half, the difference between treating people equally and as, or as equals and what, what that might entail. Um, there's, there's a certain lesson about the I-it relationship that, that, we want to, uh, that I want us to examine together. So a few takeaways. So the genuine dialogue entails risk and danger. It draws out aspects of our of ourselves, which can be transformational experiences. So if we enter into this dialogical encounter for Buber, this is entering a relationship without a map, without a compass. It is uncharted terrain. Um, you're vulnerable. You can't rely on the, um, the layers of your identity that, that you use to, to navigate a really complicated society and existence. There's something about genuine dialogue for Buber that's unsettling um, and that you're, you're taking a risk. Um, I'll give you a, a brief example of what that might mean. If we were open the way that the Buber wants us to be open to all people, it would make ourselves vulnerable in such a way that um, we, we would very often um, be disappointed and, and let down. And in fact, even embarrassed um, because sometimes you might share aspects of yourself with someone that might turn them off. And that, that in a way is, as, as we're gonna see later, is what Buber calls is a mismeeting. Um, and so we, we don't wanna engage in those relationships because we don't wanna get hurt. Now, although we tend more often tend to treat others, people or other human beings and nature like objects, so the I-it relation, we all have the ability to relate to others as unique and sacred creatures. So no matter how ensconced we are in this I-it universe and now how much I-it makes up all of our relationships, we still have the ability to, to engage people uh, with the thou which means we all have the ability to engage the, the eternal now and have the presence of, of the eternal. But here's an interesting thing. We always return to the world of I, it after any type of I, thou encounter. Um, and this is what Buber calls sublime melancholy. Um, so I can remember once, and it only happened once, that, that I was reading something while I was in college and everything in the world made sense to me at that one moment in time. My heart started racing. I felt like I had achieved some sense of enlightenment. Um, I mean, I was 20, so I, obviously I didn't have a lot of knowledge or wisdom to, to be making those claims, but it was a, it was a feeling and it was an exciting feeling uh, and, and it was fleeting. And I started to read everything I could to sort of um, re-engage that feeling. The problem, I guess, that, that what Buber would diagnose me as saying is I was already starting to look for it as I was, I was reading. Um, but I was upset that I had to come back to the world where, in fact, I didn't have all the answers to everything and that I didn't have a sense of it all. That, in fact, I became, as, as we say in Yiddish, a, a little pisha. Um, and, uh, and all of those feelings sort of evaporated. Another takeaway is Buber's critique of organized religion does not imply denial of it. So throughout I and Thou, and especially in part three, he's critiquing religion. But we shouldn't say that, that for Buber, the world would be better off without it. He's just trying to ameliorate the conditions within religion to help people have a better sense of their interpersonal relationships so that they can engage 
uh, the eternal. In, in many ways, he, he's wanting religion to be more spontaneous and less rigid. But at the same time, he wants people that change their orientation in a world in which they can be um, amenable to, to, the, to the religious interpersonally. Now, Buber also wants to change the way we think, live, and the way we talk and relate to one another. So as you're guessing, Buber is going to ask a lot of us and of the world. He really wants to radically change everything. And when we get to the section with Ayn Dao, we're going to see how, mu how much all the more so um, he's really trying to, to answer some of the deepest questions of existence. So here's the quote that, that I want to start with. It comes from your reading today. That you need God more than anything, you know at all times in your heart. But don't you know also that God needs you in fullness of his eternity, you? How would man exist if God did not need him? And how would you exist? You need God in order to be, and God needs you for that which is the meaning of your life. And it's that, that final sentence that the, the rest of this first part is going to be devoted. You need God in order to be, and God needs you for that which is the meaning of your life. So here are the three stories. I'm going to return to his relationship to his mother that we talked about in the first session, and I'll be quick because we, we went over it. Then I want to share with you an anecdote um, that he shared in his autobiographical fragments about an encounter he had with a horse. I know, Boober and the horse. I mean, it sounds like the, the premise of a terrible joke. Um, maybe after this class, it might be. Um, and then we're going to talk about an encounter he has with a soldier coming back from, from war. Um, these three stories really impacted the way he started to think about dialogue intellectually and emotionally. So the first in encounter, uh, an abandoned child. So as you know, Buber's mother left him at a very early age, uh, and he was sent to live with his grandparents. And for all intents and purposes, he never recovered. He didn't have, he had a very lonely childhood uh, he didn't interact with people his own age until he started going to school when he was in Poland, when he was 11 years old. And so um, it, it had a traumatic uh, affect on him. He writes, whatever I learned in the course of my life about the meaning and meeting and dialogue between people springs from that moment when I was four. So his relationship with his mother really set him in, in a certain trajectory. He coins the term Vergegnung. And if you look in any German dictionary, you won't find it. Um, he made it up. And it, it roughly translates as mismeeting. And so this is an important term for him because all of human life and all, all of our day-to-day -day encounters are more open to this idea that, that we, we miss meet. Um, so if somebody is in need, for instance, somebody is suffering, somebody lost someone that they loved, you feel appropriately, you, you feel that you wanna comfort that person and sometimes you say the wrong thing um, and you have a miss meeting. Um, sometimes the, the words that come out of your mouth don't get received the way that you intend them that's a mismeeting. Sometimes you hear something in, in a way that, that wasn't intended by the, the speaker. That's a mismeeting. Sometimes the experiences in your, your everyday lead up to decisions that you would have never made otherwise, external factors that affect your mood. There are so many ways in which we meet past one another, that we mismeet, that it creates a sense of, of loneliness and, and even despair um, because there's a lot of, um, lot of opportunities for engagement, but more, um, more missed meetings as a result. And he writes later, um, children experience what happens and keep silent, 
but in the night they groan in the dream in their dreams awaken and stare into the darkness the world has become unreliable it is up to us to make the world reliable again for children it depends on us whether we say to them and to ourselves don't worry mother is here so if you remember uh going back to the first class i talked about this this german term die geborgenheit which it, it describes that sense of security in the presence of a parent or that sense of uh, security in seeing a, a face that that you recognize and know in a crowd of strangers um and that there, there's a sense of trust between people that, that can sort of trump any other um, mismeeting in your life or, or any other uncomfortable experience. You take that experience away from a person and they are deeply alone. And what, what Buber is worried about is that the modern experience and the contemporary environment have created the conditions such that most people live without that feeling of Geborgenheit, um, that that feeling of security and trust uh, doesn't play a role in their life and it limits the opportunities for them to engage with that. And he realized that this lost feeling was something that concerned not only him, but all human beings. Not all human beings have a traumatic relationship with their mother, but for him, all human beings experience a sense of loneliness and despair that um, that can't always be reconciled through their religious traditions or um, philosophical explanations of, of meaning. Um, so well, actually, I'll get to that anecdote later. So that's that's his mother. So unmoored and adrift. He writes later in a in a in a book called Between Man and Man. The human person feels himself exposed by nature as an unwanted child is exposed, and at the same time, a person isolated in the midst of the tumultuous world. And I think that Munch's scream really um, captures this quote in a way that, that is not just poignant for its time, but is even poignant for today when you think of all the noise, all the frustration all the mismeetings that are taking place at this very moment, whether it's through news, whether it's through um, debate, um, whatever shelves that we've created to protect ourselves, there's a lot of noise in the world. And there's so much noise that you could be moving in the direction that the world has no meaning. Um, that, that sometimes the best reason won't convince anyone that we can't live in a shared empirical reality and that people are despondent and they throw their hands up or they scream Uber is trying to address this this very issue now the horse so as you know boober um had a a very sad childhood and was alone he was a very lonely child his father had a stable and he occasionally would go to the stable and pet, um, pet the horse. And this is a description, I think, um, of his, one of his earliest I thou encounters. And he writes about this, obviously, later. I say that what I experienced in the touch with the animal was the other, the immense otherness of the other which however did not remain strange like the otherness of the ox and uh, the ram, but rather let me draw near and touch it. So there was something about the way that the horse was inviting to Boober um, and, and shared a, a presence with Boober and didn't flinch, but in fact um, invited Boober to, to engage him and, and not moved away. When I stroke the mighty mane, it was as though my element of vitality itself bordered on my skin. Something that was not I was certainly not akin to me, palpably the other, not just another, but really the other itself. So a horse really is an other. We don't know what's going on in the horse's head. We don't know. Um, the feelings that the horse is necessarily expressing to us. 
It's a mystery. And yet it let me approach. So we know that there, there is some connection. Confided itself to me, placed itself elementally in the relation of thou and thou with me. And it struck me about the stroking, what fun it gave me. And suddenly I became conscious of my hand. So he lost a sense of time and space. The horse ceased to be an object. He ceased to be petting the horse. That there was an experience that happened for him with that horse that connected him to the horse in such a way that, that time and space stopped. And that when he became cognizant of his stroking of the animal, he then became conscious of, of his hand. Um, and that he returned to the world of of it and of things. This obviously was a very powerful experience for him. Um, and it opened him up to the, the idea that there are other experiences to be had in, um, in nature and, and with animals. And in your reading today, um, you, you, do, you may have remembered the, the section about the cats. Um, just as a, as a footnote, Buber had, I believe it was nine cats that there was something about cats that that he was a he was a cat philosopher or however you want to call call him but he had an affinity to cats that 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 bordered on the compulsive but um but there's something about a cat and he and he talks about this and as as you may have noticed i i also have cats i didn't put them down here on purpose it's just the kitty litter is here so um they're, they're going to do their thing um, but there is something about cats that I can come home from um, traffic and be in the worst possible mood. My, my wife, the same way, my, my children, the same way that all of us could come home at different, um, at different levels of frustration and that we certainly don't want to engage one another. The cats don't really seem to care. They don't read our emotion in the same way. They're still going to sit on our lap. And it could be that they want food or to be pet, but they're reliable in a way that human beings are not in, in terms of that kind of encounter. Um, that they're, they're going to engage me as some sort of other, even if it's for utility's sake, they want to be pet, but, but they're reliable. And that's what Buber argued. Um, so there is something special about animals. For, for Buber and nature. Now I want to move to the last, um, the last anecdote before you go to their, your breakout rooms. So Buber had a, a, um, attained a, a, a pretty impressive level of, of fame and acclaim at an early age because of his work on the Hasidim. His work on, on the ecstatic confessions was, was considered a, a masterpiece. Um, and a soldier sought him out by finding out his address and coming from battle, walked apparently 60 kilometers, showed up at Buber's door um, at apparently, and this, this, this particular story is confirmed by, by his son, Raphael, who was 16 at the time, who, who let him in. But it must have been it was something like 6.30 in the morning and um, knocked on the door. Buber was a, a workaholic, so he apparently would be up at five, work all day, all night, um, and you had to be quiet in the house. Um, this soldier wanted to speak to Buber, and, and Buber um, let him in, um, being having some, and this is before he wrote I and Thou, this is in his revelation, not legislation stage. He let him in. Uh, he poured him some tea. He held out a stop uh, his pocket watch, um, and they had a conversation for about thirty minutes. Um, the watch was there to to remind him of the time. The, the soldier asked some pointed questions, and 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 Buber did his best to to, to listen and to answer. Uh, and then when when the time was up, Buber uh, walked him to the door, uh, and he left. And there, there are several versions of what happened next, um, whether it was a day or a few days.
But news comes to Buber after the soldier left that, that he had committed suicide. And, and Buber was distraught. Um, he felt like he had, um, that he had missed something in the soldier. He had answered all of his questions. He was respectful, but he didn't see something that wasn't expressed in words. There was obviously something written on his face, on his forehead, in his gestures, in the way that he held himself. And Buber missed that. And he felt like um, he, he in some ways was, was responsible for, for not helping this, this soldier. Now for, for a number of you, um, for, for those of us that, that have experienced that in our own lives, it is very natural to believe that, that you were responsible if you're, um, if you're recalling your last accounts with somebody who, who has taken her or his own life. For Buber, this became an essential feature of, of dialogue. We simply can't just respond to the words. We need to respond to the gestures, what's written on the forehead. Um, there, there are some things in, in human contact. I, so when I was a, a professor at Virginia Tech, I, I would have office hours. And I, and I certainly, while I didn't have a pocket watch, I, I, I definitely had the clock nearby because I was anxious to get back to my own work. And students would come into my office and they would, um, and we would talk about material. But, but for a lot of students who are away from home for the first time, it's not just the material they want to talk about. And so you, you give them more time um, and you, you, you talk and, and you listen. What Buber calls unmediated listening, meaning that rather than trying to think of an answer, rather, think, rather than thinking about what I'm going to say, you simply listen and respond to what you're hearing um, as, as it comes up. And he felt like with this soldier, he did not have unmediated listening. Okay, let's go to our breakout rooms. So our first question for tonight. For Buber, the life of dialogue has a painful truth. It recognizes how difficult it is to achieve most people know how life's journey is filled with mismeetings and of the failures of I thou encounters to take place. How do we open ourselves up to dialogue without also falling into despair? Don't worry, the questions will become more optimistic um, as the night goes on. What do you think Boober's responsibility? What do you think was Boober's responsibility to the soldier? Should he have given him more than 30 minutes? It was, it was a very polite thing to do to let him in at 6.30 in the morning. I can, I can tell you no matter what level of, of notoriety I have in the community, I, I, I don't know that I would be answering the door at that time. Um, but he did. How might have unmediated listening changed the situation? So what if Buber really did respond to what he thought were the soldiers' real questions? Would that have changed things? And that's a hypothetical. Mismeetings in life seem inevitable. How do we avoid them? I like this question because you can avoid them by taking yourself out of the everyday life and not engaging. But, but for Buber, that would be unacceptable. You don't withdraw from life in order to gain access to the eternal. You live in it. So if we're going to take him at his word and live in the complicated realities of everyday life, how do we avoid, avoid missed meetings? Actually, I'm going to tell you something. You're going to go look this up because it's pretty funny. A, um, a comedian named Jonathan Goldstein, he, he complains that he says the wrong thing in every situation. And he always goes to bed at night with regret. And so what he did is he walked around with a tape recorder and tape recorded all of his interactions every day. And at the end of the day, uh, he re-recorded what he should have said at different moments so that he could have a better day, how he should have responded. If it's on This American Life. It, it, it is hilarious. It's maybe about 15 years ago. Okay. Have you or anyone you know had a similar experience that Buber described with the horse? What does being capable of such moments or experiences teach us about life? So we have 
we have several really easy questions to answer and, and 20 minutes to do it. Um, so I'll see you soon. All right, welcome back. Um, so you'll, you'll get a chance to continue talking in about 25 minutes to a half an hour. Um, in that time, I want to quickly go over Ian Val and, and some of the readings that you did for today. Um, I know that it's ambitious, but um, I hopefully I, I will get it all in so that you'll have a lot to talk about in your next breakout room. Um, so this part, I'm going to give a three-part brief introduction to Ian Val, which will be five minutes. So obviously each part will be very short. Um, a very brief summary of each book section of the book. Um, I want to share some Buberian assertions that, that will help us make sense of the third chapter. Uh, we'll do some text study. So I, I lifted out three paragraphs from, from part three that I want to read with you, ask some questions. We'll do our breakout room, um, and then we'll, we'll do some Q&A at the end. First, I want to start with a quote by... by um, by a writer named uh, Juarez Luis Borges, um, who, who is a fabulous writer. Um, and he wrote, when something is merely said or better still hinted at, there is a kind of hospitality in our imagination. So think about that when you were reading Buber. It's merely said or hinted at, but that there's hospitality because we, we can imagine things, we'll be engaged, we'll um, be thinking along with the author. We are ready to accept it. I remember reading the works of Martin Buber. I thought of them as being wonderful poems. Then I went to Buenos Aires. I read a book by a friend of mine and found in its pages to my astonishment that Martin Buber was a philosopher and that all his philosophy lay in the books I read as poetry. Perhaps I accepted these books because, um, because they came to me through poetry, through suggestion, through the music of poetry, and not as arguments. So seeing I and thou as a work of art would change the way in which we interpret it and orient around it. Um, that you will discover something new each time you read it. You will discover something new each time you experience aspects of it. But it's important for it to be interpreted um, like a work of art. And I think that Borges uh, is, is on to something, um, especially um, those of you who, who like going to museums and seeing art, how you respond to a particular work of art, regardless about what, what you know about it, it's, um, it's artist, it enters a life of its own when it enters into relation with you, regardless of its history, regardless of its intentions, you share a special relationship to that particular artwork um, that, that you fill in later with, with details, but you can't change your relationship to those particular pieces of, of art. Um, and you'll note it, and you, as, as a number of you have noticed, I, I, I very often share pieces of art that Buber um, either commented on or I think are relevant to Buber's work um, to make the, the slides more interesting. And maybe so that you can interpret the slides as a, as a piece of art. So I, thou, the three-part introduction. So it's written as a series of long and shorter aphorisms divided into three sections. So we read the third section for today. We need to resist the temptation to reduce human relations to the simple either or of Apollonian or Dionysian ways of relating to others. So he uses this, these terms all the time. What, what he means to say is, so Apollo and Dionysus are, are Greek gods that are used in romantic poetry and philosophy as um, denoting for Apollo reason and, and Dionysus passion. So that there's this dichotomy in the way in which we relate to people in the world through reason, uh, rational or irrational, passionate, emotional ways in which we, we engage the world. And for Buber, we have to stop seeing human relations as either or, either you're rational or you're um, emotional. Um, and and there's a, there's, there are certain tendencies that, that lead to, to I-its in creating those distinctions that Buber wants to transcend or move beyond. 
Um, I'll just give a quick example. Like I remember a book coming out saying men are from, from Mars and women are from Venus or, or men are from Venus and women are from Mar one of those things. And, and trying to, to talk about the ways in which men and women orient differently to the world and experience. So Buber would say that's not entirely helpful. Um, well, there, there might be some things that are, are interesting. That shouldn't be a, a whole way in which you engage uh, with the world. Um, so here's the second part. The aim of the Ein Thou is not to disseminate knowledge about God, but rather to diagnose certain tendencies in modern society. So don't study Ein Thou. Don't read it as if it's going to disclose the greater, um, the, the, the answers to the greater mysteries of the universe. Relate to it. Engage it. Think with it. It's not about um, dissemination of knowledge. Right? So there's, there's something else. And Diagnosing certain tendencies in modern society um, is very relatable to our, our contemporary condition. Um, Ayn Dal directs readers to a religiousness or religiosity which does not find a home in organized religion. So if you remember the point before, it, Buber's critical of religion, but it's not an absolute denial of it. Um, he, he has a way in the world that, that can't be contained by any one or multiple religions. Um, there, there's, there's something else at, at stake for him. Ayn Thal speaks to readers whose primary concern is with social change. It's not interested in saving or defending any institution. Um, so the, the world is fragmented, the world is broken, the world isn't what we, think it ought be or ought to be. Um, and so he's not interested in defending any institution since the world as it is, is a, is a result of these institutions. So um, he's not going to defend them. The book speaks to those who no longer believe. And I put that in quotation marks. Believe in, the, in a, in a um, even in a primordial sense, but believe in a fundamental way in their religion, but, but who also wonder whether life without religion is bound to lack something too. So if the institutions he's not worth um, interested in defending or saving are religion, he recognizes that something would be lost in the world if, if we didn't have it. And so while he won't defend it, um, he certainly will want to ameliorate it and sees a place for it, um, but it's a it's a different orientation to religion altogether. So in I and Thou, uh, Buber was trying to answer some of the most ineffable questions of human life and existence, as as I um, said previously. So obviously, some of the writing is going to be opaque; it's going to be dense, um, because he's really trying to ask. What is the meaning of existence for, for human beings? How do we achieve a feeling of wholeness and meaning that most of us painfully lack? Um, that, that we see the success of others. And there's a great, great term in Yiddish um, in taking joy in the success and accomplishment of others. It's called nachas. Um, and to give you a sense of how, how languages denote some sort of, um, I guess I'm using the word a lot, but orientation to reality. Uh, you know, in, in German, there's the word uh, die Schadenfreude, taking joy in someone else's suffering, right? So having these words as a way of indicating a certain feeling shows um, certain priorities in language um, that, that we, don't, we don't have those words usually, or some words are not always translatable, but the feeling always is, right? So, and that's, that's important for Buber. So die Schadenfreude is an important German word to take joy in others' suffering, um, but uh, we don't have that word in English, but certainly every time the New York Yankees lose, right? There's somebody in Boston who is having a great day. Um, so while we don't have the word, we, we, we certainly know the, the emotion. Um, I should say, so I'm, I think in terms of Philadelphia centric sports, so I should say every time the Dallas Cowboys lose, I'm having a good day. How do we find our way to God now that religious belief has become so challenging for modern educated people? Right, so as you study the history of religion in, in relation to politics and to life, and you study um, 
sort of critical editions of sacred scriptures. There are just lots of things that get in the way of, of, of belief that wouldn't allow you to have what, what theologians call a second innocence, right? You can't pretend not to know the things that you know in order to believe. And most people are not going to do that. But yet for Buber, it's important to find our way to God. So part one, Buber examines the human condition by exploring, exploring basic elements in human psychology. He offers his first premise. Humans have two ways of engaging the world, yet the modern experience slash world neglects one of those ways. These two ways are described as I, it, and I, thou. So think of I, it in terms of, so you have an I, and that's your ego, that's your sense of self. I remember going back to the, um, the class on Hasidim, right? There's an I that can also be, become a vessel for godliness. So, so the I can, can change, your, your sense of self can change. But living in, a, in an I-it world, um, we see our relationships as practical. Um, we, we tend to objectify to make uh, use of it. We use experience, we use the past. Um, we treat things as, as objects to us, including people. And, and it's not a moral way of being in the world insofar as that an I-it relationship is necessarily bad, right? So um, when I'm at, at the grocery store and um, the, the, the cashier is running up all of the food on, on the, um, the, the conveyor belt. Um, that person wants to get the food in, in the bag as quickly as, as he or she can. I, I want to help to get there as quickly as, as I can so I can get home and do my other errands so that that, per and that person needs to, to meet the, the, the next customer. Um, so our relationship is transactional. Um, it, it doesn't mean that it, it's unpleasant. It just means that each of us sees ourselves as a means to an end. Um, and the, the problem for Buber is that those types of relationships have, be, have become so predominant in, in everyday life that, that we really tend to use people um, for our ends. Um, I, was, I was actually having a conversation with, with one of my colleagues today about a different conversation that I had with a different colleague about how upset he was that I wouldn't agree with him and that he, he, he actually prayed all night that, that I would come wake up, he would wake up in the morning and that I could come to him and agree with him. So I was a means to an end. I was getting in the way of a, a position of his and rather than addressing me um, in, in myself, in my, in my needs, his goal was to bring me around to his. That again is not a bad thing if you're going to live in a political environment um, with, with laws and policies. Um, but the problem for Buber is I, it also becomes part of religious life, um, sacramental time, and God becomes our it. And so what he's trying to do is demonstrate these two ways of being in the world. And that the I, thou for, for him is is where we get our spirituality. It's where we get our creativity. Um, but it's not done alone. It's done in community and it's done through others. That he really believes that um, withdrawing from the world uh, takes away any, um, any way that you can access the eternal. So in the third part, he's talking a little bit about Buddha and the, the Upanishads. Um, and that escaping from the world isn't a way of, of actually escaping your, um, your eternal realities in it. You have to affirm them. Okay, part two. Buber ex examines humanity in society, both society and how people operate within it. Um, he argues that contemporary society alienates individuals because it only functions out of one of the two ways into human experience. So if we live in a society that doesn't create the conditions for any type of I thou encounter, and think about it, even in our most intimate um, educational experiences, right? You have to get good grades, you have to, you have to pass exams. Um, it becomes hierarchical and competitive. Um, we, we rate students in terms of who's more brilliant or exceptional than that. Everyone has some sort of objectification from the very beginning, from the from what classes you're in to, to the grades that you make, 
that you're always seeing something as a means to an end for Buber. Um, and that there are no moments in our society that are designated for the potential for, for I-thou relations. So that we shouldn't be surprised when um, society looks the way that it does. Societies have built, been built on I-it relations, politics, economics, public institutions, and even much of private life is, um, I, I think of social media, right? The, the number of likes you get on a post or um, that might've been 10 years ago. I haven't really kept up with it, but, but there's a certain anxiety about um, how, how you view yourself on social media in, in terms of uh, how people respond to, to what it is that you're doing. And then existential angst, worries of meaningless or of impending doom result because of our dependence on I-8 relationships. So think about the grind and how time moves so quickly because of the grind. Um, you wake up early, you go to work, you're in a car, you listen to the news, or you have your everyday life is set for you. Um, and every relationship that you have is an I-it relationship. And you continually do this. And that your dependence on I-it grows to the point where you actually believe that the world that you inhabit is only in of I-it relations, which creates a sense of loneliness because you want meaning. And this is even for Buber, uh, it includes religious people as well. Um, that there's a certain stagnation in, in church, churches and synagogues. Uh, he didn't know many mosques so I, until he moved to Israel and, and, uh, or Jerusalem. Um, but that was after he wrote Ayn Dao. Um, but this, this angst is, is a result of the relationships that we built the world on. And so Buber interprets the role of religion in contemporary life in the third part as a way, interestingly, of not only critiquing it, but also as a way of trying to change the conditions of the world to allow for, for godliness to enter. Um, and so th also think back to the, the Hasidim class. Recognizing the arguments of the first two sections, Buber offers a way into building a meaningful society, a true community, by by properly employing the second way of being the I thou. And that's why it was a very complicated section because he, he's talking about ways in which you, you create the conditions for I thou, but he can't prescribe them. He can't tell you how to do it. He can't necessarily tell society how to do it. We have to create conditions for these, these encounters that are so important and provide so much meaning in people's lives. So he uses I thou relations as a way to relate to God and to bring God into one's life in a meaningful way. And he writes, the I it world coheres in space and time. The you world does not cohere in either. It coheres in the center in which extended lines of relationships intersect in the eternal you. Right? So those moments that you have with individuals or with a horse um, or cats, where time and space pause, and that you feel a certain connection that is not always describable, but something that is tra that tra transforms you. Um, I will say it's usually with, with human beings, and, and that's where a certain sense of revelation can be felt, um, but, but it also can be with, with nature and, and with animals. And that transformation means that once you've had those encounters, you see that that living thing differently, that you're less likely to want to control or manipulate it or make, um, make it as a means to your end. Um, I, I will say like driving home today, I was just wondering in traffic if all of us had like I thou encounters at some point with each driver or some drivers, then maybe we would just be more kind to one another on the road and, and get home in a more reasonable fashion, right? That we would not constantly see each other as, as it's. And I have some seen some extraordinarily bad driving in Baltimore. I mean, I love it here. It's, it's, it's my city, but, but whoa. Um, but the, it, it has to do with how we're relating to one another uh, for Boober. And, um, but when you have these encounters, you're more open to them. They become less abstract. You, you wanna have them again. You wanna be open to them. Now, Buber, he considered three people to have fully realized this kind of relation. So Socrates, he, he believes that 
with, with human beings and humanity, he had this, this I thou relation. So with Jesus, it's, it's with God. Um, that's what makes him sort of uh, controversial within Jewish communities. He's not suggesting um, Jesus was God or even incarnate, but he's saying that the Jesus of the gospels had a relationship to God that, that was exemplary of an I thou encounter. Um, and then finally, Goethe with, with nature, uh, the, the 19th century German writer. Um, and so here are some Buberian assertions before we get to our texts. It's important to know that the sacred is found in time in the here and now. So don't look to the past, don't look to the future, don't look for anything prescribed, just orient yourself in such a way that, that you have unmediated listening, um, and you can find the sacred in the here and now for Buber. The only God worth keeping is a God that can't be kept. So this is, this is critical. You may experience a glimpse of that divine, but it's yours only for that moment. Um, and it, you can't have that same experience again. Each experience is unique. And the problem with institutional religion for Buber is it tries to recreate those experiences in a way that it turns God into an it. God is a subject, is unique, and so your relationship and experiences with, with God through, through people or through nature will always be unique. Never, you can never replicate them. The only God worth talking about is a God that cannot be talked about. So th this has a, uh, a traditionalist um, medieval Jewish view about God. Remember the, the whole apophatic theology that you can't say God exists because that's an idolatrous statement. So you say God does not not exist. Um, so, but for Buber, a God that is not an object at all, God is complete subject is the only God um, worth talking about. And that's a God that you can't really explain. So you're really not talking about God. And yet God is at the center of all of it. God is not an object of discourse, knowledge, or experience. Right? So the, the whole object, this is important, an S, the, the ish S, God can't be an object. And so think about petitional prayer, right? So praying to God as God in the third person, you're asking God for things. Um, or calling God in, in the Hebrew prayers, you, you sometimes call God king of the universe. Um, that's an it. And that that is not uh, acceptable for, for Buber for creating genuine religious encounters. God cannot be spoken of, but God can be listened to. And so it's not suggesting that the God is necessarily speaking, but that there's an attunement, there's an orientation to the world, um, that, that you see things again, you hear things again through your, um, your orientation to the thou. The only possible relationship with God is to address God and to be addressed by God here and now in the present moment. Again, sacred, the sacred is found in the here and now, and it is fleeting. Um, and this is uh, important. Buber interprets the Hebrew name of God, the Tetragrammaton. Um, for, for those of you who know Hebrew, yeah, share yeah, um, which sometimes gets translated as God will be, I, I will, will be that I will be, or I am that I am. It's the answer that God gives to Moses when Moses says to, to God, who should I tell Pharaoh sent me? And God says, yeah, share yeah. Um, and he translated, translates it as God is present. So what, what does that mean? The Tetragrammaton itself is a play on the word uh, to be, uh, meaning the name that, which gets translated as Jehovah. The four letter name of God um, is a play on the word to be. So it's, it's past, present, and future combined into one word. Um, and that it, it sort of denotes what we say, and it's a fancy grammatical term, prolepsis. It's denoting a, um, a, a present tense, We're using a present tense to denote the future. So, you know, in, in the morning when I'm trying to get my kids to go, get ready to go to school, they'll, they'll never commit by saying that they're not doing it. They'll just say, I'm coming, right? They may be on their phone, but they extend the present in, in such a way that, that they may or may not actually do the action, but it's an extended present. Um, and so Buber sees God's answer to Moses in that way, that God's saying, I am, with the same grammatical form that, that my children use when, when they say that they're coming. Um, so that means that you can't fully grasp God's being. And this is important because 
there's an interpretation of Isaiah 43, 12, uh, a passage that, that that's probably not a famous passage, right? I, I alone foretold the triumph and I brought it to pass. I announced it and no strange God was among you. So you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. A sixth century Midrash interprets this passage as such. It's called the Pesikta Devrav Kahana. If you testify to me, then I'm God and not otherwise. And the way that the rabbis interpreted this it made them very uncomfortable because it's saying that if you don't testify to God, that God doesn't actually exist, that there's a certain divine need in human beings trusting God, that God's existence is dependent on human beings, right? And, that, and it's sort of this chicken and egg um, theological debate, right? So if human beings created, or what was it? it was Nietzsche, right? God, God created human beings, um, and in return, human beings created God, right? So it's 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 supposed to be a um, a, a playful reading for Buber on on God's presence, but it's essentially saying it doesn't matter which came first, who created whom, who invented whom, or who discovered whom. There there is a, a, a almost a dialectical and dialogical relationship between God and human beings um, that requires a, a certain orientation to testifying to God's existence. So what, what are we doing with time? All right, so again, I, I talked too much, um, but I really do want to go through some of these texts. Um, this particular text, I'll, I'll jump ahead. It's the one where, where God, um, people misuse the name of God or use God. But this, this one is really an interesting one, and it's from 126 to 127. Every actual relationship to another being in the world is exclusive. Its you is freed and steps forth to confront us in its uniqueness. If you look at every human being and every possible relationship as unique, and think about that for a second, that means you're denying your own experience in the world and your own wisdom to treat everything in its uniqueness. As long as the presence of the relationship endures, this world wideness cannot be infringed, right? So treating each relationship and each conversation as something unique creates a, a way for you to push away the, um, the, the influences of an I, it world. But as soon as the you becomes an it, the wa world wideness Wideness of relationships appears as an injustice against the world and its exclusiveness as an exclusion of the universe, right? So you should be open to the possibility that the cashier that's ringing you up at the uh, supermarket, that you and that person could have an encounter, an I thou encounter, or I'll make it more dramatic. You get pulled over by a police officer for speeding, right? You're doing, I, I know that the speed cameras are up on the Jones Falls, but um, but I'm sure they're still pull, pulling people over, that it's possible for the officer and for the, 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 the person being pulled over um, that, that you can have this I thou encounter. And I use that example very, very sensitively because um, as, as we know here in Baltimore, depending on who gets pulled over, depends on the, the type of confidence you would have in engaging an officer. Um, and and that's, a, that's, a, it's a, that's a real issue here. Um, and that's an it. Right? Whether, whether I get pulled over or whether um, someone else gets pulled over who's African-American, um, these are different it's. My, mine would be a more um, privileged it, right? Because the, the, the fear of violence and retribution are not in my encounter with that officer. But if all of us had this openness, including the officer for, for Boober, um, we can block off the objectification of humans. That police officer is no longer a police officer, is a person who I can have a unique encounter with. And the driver who's speeding is not just another person speeding, but a, a person that you can have an encounter with. Imagine the, the possibilities. And it doesn't mean that everyone's gonna speed all the time. It just means that you will treat people differently. In the relationship, or maybe it will, I don't, I'm, I can't make those statements, but, or, or prove those statements, but in the relation to God, unconditional exclusiveness and unconditional inclusiveness are one, right? So the, the idea that there's this unification, this mystical unification. And for those who enter into the absolute relationship, so the I-thou relationship, so those of you who enter it, nothing particular retains of any importance, right? So a uniform disappears. Um, 
the glasses disappear. Whatever it is that you've objectified that person as, or you've seen as an it, is no longer there. It's a raw, um, un, unfiltered human being. Um, neither things, not beings, neither heaven nor earth, but everywhere is included in the relationship. Um, looking away from the world is no help toward God, right? So you can't throw your hands in the air and say all of this noise, this thing, thinking back to the Munch painting, all of this noise is crazy. I'm going to close my ears and look up to the heavens. That's not going to be helpful. Um, but whoever beholds the world in him and stands in his presence, right? So living in the world, living within the possibility of transformation with all the individuals, all people being unique, um, allows for a certain freedom for Buber that, that we can encounter God and, and, and godliness. Um, and this is the final part before we get to our breakout room. Although we on earth never behold God without world, but only the world in God, and so thinking of the panantheistic and panandeistic from um, two classes ago, by beholding we externally form God's form. Right? So beholding the we, and this is an interesting move that, that it's no longer an I, but a we, the, the move toward community. Form is a mixture of you and it too. Right? So you need to live in both worlds. In faith and cult, it can freeze into an object. Right, so God is it. But from the gist of the relation that survives in it, it turns ever again into presence. So prayer is a legitimate form of engaging the presence of God, as long as God in that prayer is not an it. God is near his forms as long as man does not remove them from him. Right, so keeping God as presence and as subject. And prayer is tricky, right? Because remember what Buber had said with Rosenswag, um, that, that praying to God becomes this inner dialogue where, where God is only just an extension of your sense of self. But in true prayer, cult and faith are unified and purified into living relation. So this idea that he had talked about praying in the marketplace, not limiting your prayer to the walls of your, your, your religious institution, but seeing the possibility for prayer anywhere and at any time and having genuine uh, prayer in relation to God, even in the most extreme conditions. Remember the marketplace that you're, you're fighting over tomatoes. There's that possibility uh, for prayer. That true prayer lives in religion, testifies to their true life. As long as it lives in them, they live. Right? So he's critical of religion. But if you have um, an orientation to, to prayer that is dialogical, you, you have that possibility to, to change religion, uh, to make your religion uh, better. And so I thought that was a very powerful paragraph. Um, so let me give you a summary before you go to your breakout rooms. So we tend to treat people in the world around us as things to be used for our benefit. Um, without the mindset, the I, it, there would be no science, economics, or politics, right? So Uber is not saying that we shouldn't have an I, it world. Um, far from it. He, he recognizes the need for, for I, it relations, even in our systems, but we do need to create conditions for I, thou, and experiences, right? And so that, that's important, right? So if you go back to an example where somebody is wearing a uniform, or somebody has a, um, a title, right? How you relate to people based on these, um, let's say, objectifying criteria prevents you from engaging the thou, um, because you're always referring to them, and this is the German term, in the Z, right? So if you see someone in a hierarchical way, and and I joke all the time, right? Like I, I have I have a PhD, so people call me doctor. And only once in my life did I really want people to call me doctor. And that was after I got my, my PhD, um, right? So return to sender. Benjamin Sachs doesn't live, any here, live, any, live here anymore. It's only Dr. Sachs. But all of those things need to go away in every one of my encounters for me to actually have genuine experience. Uh, and, and, and so for, for Buber, while in some cases that's important, 
In many cases, it's, it's not. The more we engage in such thinking, the farther we drift from I, you. So the, the more we have I, it uh, dominate our lives and that we live our lives in relation to an I, it, um, the further away we're gonna get from this, this I, you experience. And, and this is important, right? Because even your relationships of love can become I, it relationships in the worst possible way. Um, even elective affinities, you know, falling in love and choosing the person with whom you want to spend your rest of your life with can have I, it qualities that, that can be irredeemable. And, and, um, and that's the private life of the I, it relation. And only when we say you to the world do we perceive it as miraculous strangeness and at the same time, the potential for intimacy. Isn't it nice sometimes not to know? Isn't it nice sometimes to, to tremble? Um, there's, the, there's a quote that I didn't share, but from a children's book about um, a mouse looking at the, the stars and reeling the, realizing the incredible oneness of, a, of it all. And then he rolls off the boat and, and gets wet. But having those moments, those brief moments of understanding how small you are um, can be quite powerful, especially in terms of intimacy. And the God that Buber described here is neither a lawgiver nor a merciful redeemer. So it's neither um, uh, it, it's neither the the uh, the caricatures of biblical gods, of whether it's the Hebrew Bible God or the, the New Testament God. It's neither, um, but a close presence to whom we can always turn to intimacy, right? Die Geborgenheit, that we can always feel that sense of security. Remember the quote that you need God more than anything, right? So th this feeling of security and trust that despite a world gone completely crazy and, and ensconced and operating entirely in I it relations, you need that sense of trust to keep you grounded um, in the world and to give you, and this is a future oriented verb, hope. Um, but you, but don't you know that God needs you in the fullness of his eternity, right? So think about it in the trust that you have in between people, the trust that you have, that, that, that you have with, with animals or with nature. Um, that trust needs to be extended to this, this presence of God as well. So God's presence in I and Thou is essential for addressing the many problems associated with contemporary society. So here are your breakout room questions. What are the emotional and existential risks involved in Buber's understanding of dialogue as you understand it at this point? Um, how might we use Buber's understanding of God interreligiously, right? So if everybody is, um, if he's critiquing all religion, um, he has something to say about our all of our orientation to religion, but how could we how could it be helpful in, um, in advancing interreligious dialogue? How, how can our conversations be um, not just strengthened, but create the kind of trust that, 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 in, that, that we want to build interreligiously? How might Buber be helpful to addressing the salient political economic issues of our day, such as climate change, economic inequality, discrimination and persecution, among others? Um, you know, we can't all have I thou encounters with everyone all the time. But how might Buber teach us to, to better deal with all of these issues? Right. And there's no panacea to these uh, questions. And then let's return to the first question. Is God and or godliness found in treating people equally or as equal? So I gave you a number of examples in interpersonal relationships. Um, in those relationships, do you see the person as equal to you or you do you treat all people equally? All right, so that's where we're going to go. Um, so 20 minutes and then, uh, and then we'll dedicate the last 10 minutes for, for some Q&A. So see you soon. So we have a few minutes and, and we thought that tonight maybe... Um, we could do some some Q and A. Um,
I mean, if you if you feel like sharing some of the the ideas that have come out of um, your your conversations, that that's also fine. Um, but I'm happy to at least try to answer some of your questions if uh, if you have any. My hope was that it was all clear. Yes, Donna. Uh, you're you're muted. I hate when people do that. Um, when I was reading and I had to reread it a couple times and you brought it up today about we need God more than anything and God needs us. My first reaction was negative and then I read it again and then I thought, well, maybe. And then I thought, what does he mean by need? A lot of times we're kind of negative in our society about people needing, quote, too much. And, yeah. and sometimes in relationships, people who are into intimate relationships are called needy when they're not. And there's need meaning I have to have it and there's need, I choose to need something. So I don't know, I, I could see That's it. A great question. It is God's choice, I guess. But I, I'm not saying I disagree. I don't know if I disagree or not. What does he mean by needing? So I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't look at it in terms of need of possession. Like I, I need food um, to, to live, right? I need, um, there are certain things that I need to do every day. I need to sleep. And if we, if we see need in terms of um, uh, the, the basic things that we get to, to at least flourish, attempt to try to flourish in, in life, he would put God in that position. Um, that, that we don't actually become human if um, that need isn't met. And that need is being blocked by uh, a culture that has created I-it relationships to the point that the very thing that you need for human flourishing, this, this experience of, of God is being denied to you. So see it as being like, like water is being denied to you, education, all of the things that, um, and this is where I'm going to sound very political, but all the things that are should be for like basic human rights, right? So, but for so, God, what does He mean? Well, that's that's the the thing. That's, so, I think He may. I think I might agree with him if I understood what He means by that. So, so he he's talking about a um, a, a Hasidic slash Kabbalistic view of God in which there is a partnership between gods and uh, God and and humans that that starts with the creation of the world um, and that that God needs human beings to to actually complete God's creation oh. uh, that that um, create the completion of creation is through redemption right so when the world is redeemed it's complete and human beings play a role in it but revelation those experiences of the ineffable are ways to remind you that that the work isn't done um, and and to continue doing the work um, of of making the world a better place. So it's it's a, it's a mystical view of God. But that's a that's a good question. I'm gonna I'm actually I'm gonna go to Peter now. I see other hands that are up. Peter. Okay. Hey Peter. Um, hey. Um, I don't know if this is a dumb question, but um, I was thinking, you know, during your your lecture that. When we talked about Martin Buber and his life, and he came, he had some setbacks. His mother rejected him. He had a very isolated life growing up, and he developed this philosophy um, uh, about people relating to each other. Did did he mean for that to help society or to help individuals? And if he meant it for to help individuals, did it help him? Like you're your knowledge of his life and how like, you know, um, the end of his life, his, his, his marriage, his family life. Do you think he was a better person for having developed that philosophy? I do. Um, personally, I do. Um, he, he had a hard time maintaining the relationships that, that he, he hoped to inspire in others. You know how I talked about the Z and the do. He 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 actually had a very difficult time um, maintaining those kinds of relationships. And when his wife passed away, and what we're going to talk about this in the sixth class, right? He he completely felt unmoored from from existence because this was his life partner uh, in a way that um, no other person could 
or no nothing could fill that that void for him that that she she had in terms of like the individual and society they 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 go hand in hand so for him society develops like a personality and it, it's to the whims of individuals but individuals need to work to create a better society in in a way that he, remember the quote with the children so children develop the intuitions to have these I thou encounters so that um, they they themselves can continue in the work in creating a more it's not just equitable but but spiritually open um, in a way that and this is this is where it gets kind of uh, how do I say this um, new agey right so you can't transcend the historical experiences that separate us that would be unethical. Um, in, in that they, they inform our everyday life. But wouldn't it be great at some point that um, human beings themselves together while recognizing those histories can transcend them together. And so it's, it, it's not easy. And like, like I said in the, um, the question or the reaction questions or breakout room questions, um, trying to live a dialogical life is there's a certain tragic irony in that, that, that you spend a lot of time lonely. Um, mm -hmm. Debbie. Okay, so I, I wanna go back to some things that we talked about in previous classes about yeah. dialogue um, with others, uh, with other human be beings as a, as a way of knowing God, that it's, it's through that relationship with others that we get to know God. And I wonder what Buber uh, might have said about the idea of um, God forming man in, in his image. Um, was, did B Buber see that as um, understanding that God meant for us to see, to find God through others with our relationships with other human beings? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. And it's, it's complicated because the, the, the idea of B'Tselem Elohim, the image of God, is that a lot of people misunderstand that is that it's the same image to each person, right? So when you understand how unique people are, despite the similarities. Um, it's what's called in Hebrew, a kalva chomer argument, an a fortiori argument. All the more so, God is unique in each individual encounter with each individual human. So even though my experience of God might be, be different than yours, the fact that both of us can orient to this, this experience is essential and shouldn't be taken away from, from either of us. And what's also important is that it's not hierarchical. Yours is no more true than mine and, and vice versa. That, that however those experiences inform and transform our lives and how we react to them isn't as important. As, it, it's not as important um, as the fact that we experience them themselves. But your experience can't be mine and, and, and vice versa. So it, it creates an understanding of God that is elusive. Right, that you can't define, that you can't, um, you know, it, it, what is that term in um, calculus? An asthmatope, right? Every time you get close to the absolute zero, or it just goes a little further away. Um, but that for, for, for Buber is essential for dialogue because um, you don't want to capture any moment, you, you, you just want to live in it. Um, but that's a it's, a, it's, it also discloses an idea of what. God is for, for Buber, and, and God is this, this presence, this ex experience that, that's not simply um, a, uh, a king of the universe that, that, that has a personality, but in fact, something, a glue of, of all human beings um, that, um, that we, we sort of sever that glue in such a way. It's, a, it's not pantheistic, it's... Um, but it, but the idea is that God is living in relation to each human being individually, uniquely, um, and that that's a for for Buber that's essential for for dialogue. That I meet you, understanding that 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 you have that experience too, although it may not be similar to my to my own. Um, I notice that we are at at nine oh three. Um, that's a that was a nice question to. Uh, to end the, the night on. So what we're going to do next week 
is we're going to take these complications and we're going to try to understand them in how in, in Buber's politics. Um, Buber, as I said in previous classes, is an iconoclastic Zionist thinker, meaning that the most Zionists or people who consider themselves Zionists disagree with Buber um, because he's going to try to use this dialogical philosophy politically. Um, and, and think about that for a moment. He's against nationalism. He's uh, against institutional religions. So how do you create community and st states based in communities when, when those things don't exist? And what's interesting and what you're going to read is a debate he has with Mahatma Gandhi. Um, Gandhi is going to say something about Jews um, in relation to the Holocaust and Zionism. And Buber is going to respond to both. And, um, and I think we're going to see a Buber that uh, that that is that is political in, in a way that, that most people don't like mo most people don't think of Buber as a political thinker, but my goal in the fifth class is to at least convince you that that he might be. Um, that this, this has political applications as well. I I can't thank you enough for staying with me all the way to the fourth class. This is this is great. Um, next week we'll do the politics and then we'll do the dialogical community. And you should also know at some point. We're going to have the biographer of, of Buber come to the Institute or come. He's in Jerusalem, but come on Zoom to talk about his biography of Buber. Uh, and in the next week, I'm going to give you more details of that as a, as a way of making you come next week, because that's the only way I'm going to that's the only way you're going to get the information. No, I'm kidding. All right. Have a good night. It's great to see all of you.